once again, thank you very, very much for having me. It's great to be here. Charles Spurgeon, C.H. Spurgeon, was a great Baptist preacher in London in the 19th century. And in early life, he quite often used to preach outdoors. And one of the challenges if you're going to preach outdoors is to gather a crowd. And one of his tricks was to put a top hat down on the floor and then to point at it and say, it's alive, it's alive. And a crowd would wonder what was under the top hat. It's alive. And then he'd go and pick up the top hat and pick up a Bible and say, it's alive. Because God in the Bible says that God's word is living and active, sharper than the two-edged sword. What we're about as we study the scriptures is not examine an ancient word that was written then has really got no interest to us today except for historians. Because the amazing miracle is what God said then, he says today. This is not only his inspired word in history, it's his contemporary word. And so insofar as I'm able to expound faithfully the passage we're looking at today, we are hearing the voice of the living God. It's quite a thought, isn't it? So we'd better pray. Let me begin with a prayer. Father, your word is indeed living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. And I pray that you'd help me to be faithful so that I preach what is truly what you are saying. And we pray that all of us would be enabled to hear your voice. And then by your spirit, give us the gift of faith and obedience. For Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to look at a passage from one of my favorite books in the Bible, the book of Revelation. When I first looked at Revelation, I thought, I can't make head or tail of this. But actually, the more I've read of it, the more I've realized this this is meant to be understood. And there's a huge amount that I'm sure we will gain from Revelation chapter 1, which is the passage I'm going to read, verses 9 through to 20. So if you've got a Bible, Revelation 1, 9 to 20. I, John your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, I turned round to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash round his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace, And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look. I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. I was watching a quiz show on TV a little while ago. And a man was doing brilliantly well. He had answered all the questions, and so he got to the final question. If he got this right, he was going to get the star prize. It was a huge sum of money. 
to the questioner ask the question. And the man clearly didn't quite know the answer. And then various members of the audience shouted out different possible answers. And you can look at him looking panicked, trying to think to himself, which of these voices am I going to listen to? And can I say that is the key question that faces each one of us. It goes right back to the beginning of time. It is the fundamental question. Adam and Eve in the garden heard the voice of God. And what a voice. He said, you can eat of any of the trees in the garden, but of this one tree you may not eat. But then another voice appeared in the garden. The voice of the serpent, Satan, who twisted the word of God and tempted Adam and Eve to disobey the word of God, and so they ate of that tree. And because they listened to the wrong voice, the whole of humanity has suffered ever since, and the world is not as it should be. And yet, wonderfully, despite the way that human beings have turned a deaf ear to the voice of God and listened to other voices instead, God is a God of amazing grace. He's still speaking. He came to earth in the person of his Son, the living word, Jesus Christ, and he still speaks to us in the gospel. And the big question that faces any human being is, will I listen to the other voices or will I listen to the voice of Jesus when he says, come, I love you, I died for you, trust in me and follow me. And for some of you today, that's the voice you need to listen to for the first time. You've never responded to the voice of Christ. But for the rest of us, that is still the fundamental question that faces us every day of our lives. Which voice will we listen to? The voice within that says, oh, go on. It doesn't matter. It'll make you feel good. You'll enjoy it. No one need know. Or the voice of a colleague who says, oh, frankly, everyone does this in our line of work. It's not a big deal. Oh, you might say it's technically wrong, but um, don't trouble yourself with an over-awkward conscience. Just, just join the gang. Come along, do it with us. Or the voice of the world saying, you haven't lived until you've had this experience or that experience, even if those things are actually forbidden by Jesus in the Scriptures. Or the voice of our culture saying that Christianity is out of date, and at some points, immoral. It goes against the, the spirit of the age and what we think is right and wrong. And if you're going to be uh, someone who's really accepted in this society, you need to abandon this old-fashioned book, the Bible. There's so many voices. And amongst them all, the voice of Jesus Christ saying, this is the way, follow it. Which voice will we listen to? In church today... Well, that's relatively easy. But in the workplace, tomorrow, amongst a non-Christian family, with those who don't know Jesus at school or uni, which voice will we listen to? That's the key issue for us. It was a massive issue for those to whom John addresses this book, the book of Revelation. You see, we sense, don't we, if we're going to listen to the voice of Jesus, there will be a cost There'll be things that we want to do that we won't be able to do. There'll be people who think we're a bit weird. We might not feel we belong. There'll be a cost. But believe me, that is nothing compared to the cost that was faced by those to whom this book was first addressed. We're not given a date. It's written in the first century. The best guess, I think, from scholars is the early 90s AD. At the time of the emperor Domitian, the Roman emperor, we know that this letter, this book, is written to Christians in what is now Western Turkey, and it seems that it was a time of real persecution. People were dying for their faith. And John writes, verse 9, I, John, your brother and companion, in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So it seems he's been exiled because of his conviction that Jesus Christ is Lord and because of his preaching about Jesus. 
And so the authorities have whisked him away. He's miles away from home. He's suffering. And he writes to the Christians he knew well from the region that he had been working in. And he says, I'm your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. If you look at those words, suffering, kingdom, patient endurance, you get the message of the book in a nutshell. What you've got in the Christian life is suffering and kingdom. It's very important we hold them both together. Some give you the impression you've just got suffering. It's a miserable life, but there's no compensation. It's just tough. You're having to say no to the world. Well, why'd you bother? Others just talk kingdom. But Jesus is king. Come to him, and he'll deal with all your problems. He's the king. If you really trust in him, you'll be healthy and wealthy. And John says, no, these two belong together. Yes, Jesus Christ is king. Praise that. Praise him for that. He died. He rose. He is reigning at the right hand of God. The kingdom of God has come and is now possible to enter his kingdom and have relationship with God by the Holy Spirit and to know him as our father and to be absolutely sure that one day he'll come again and then everyone will bow the knee and everyone will recognize his lordship and the kingdom will come in all its fullness, but it hasn't come yet. Not in all its fullness. Sadly, most people reject him as king. The world is still in rebellion against him. And so if we submit to Jesus as king, we can expect to feel out of place in our culture. Strangers and aliens in the world. And there'll be suffering that goes with that. Suffering and kingdom. It's wonderful to be a Christian. We've been forgiven. We know God. He's changing us by the Spirit. But it's tough being a Christian. Suffering. And because of the suffering, at times we'll be tempted to give up. And so John, in this whole book of Revelation, is urging us, in the midst of suffering, in the light of the kingdom that has come and will come fully in the future, to keep going, patient endurance. And for some of you, that's what you need to hear this morning. Yes. Because it's been tough this week, living for Christ. And you've been wondering, is it really worth it? It may be that you're even tempted to give up on the faith altogether. More likely, you'll keep on coming to church. You'll still be known as a Christian, but actually you'll compromise. And where there's a real cost, you'll just go with the flow and fit in. And John is writing and saying, no, what I'm urging you to do is in the midst of suffering, because of the kingdom which has come and will come, I'm urging you to patient endurance. Listen to the voice of Jesus. But before he writes this book, which contains a message from Jesus, he's got to be sure himself that this is a voice worth listening to. Who is the one who speaks in the book of Revelation? John hears a voice, and he looks around to see who is speaking this voice. And what he sees in this amazing vision convinces him that's a voice worth listening to. He is Lord, the Lord of all, the Lord of death, the Lord of the church. Let's have a look at those in turn. He's the Lord of all. I'm looking now mainly at verses 12 to 16. John says, I turned round to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. The lampstands are the churches. We'll think more about that in a moment. And there amongst the lampstands is someone like a son of man. Doesn't mean much to us, perhaps. Son of man, someone human. That's what it sounds like. But you may remember that in the Gospels, Jesus' preferred way of talking about himself, certainly in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is son of man. So when they called him Christ, he acknowledged that. He is the Christ, but he didn't choose to use that title nearly as much as he chose to use the title Son of Man. And that is, that's not a kind of modest title, oh, I'm just a son of man, me. Now this is the most exalted title you'll find in the Old Testament. The key to understanding the book of Revelation is the Old Testament. And this is an allusion to the prophecy of the prophet Daniel, who also had a vision. It was a time of great suffering for the people of God. He was in exile. 
And yet he has a vision. And in his vision, he sees coming out of the sea a series of beasts. And these beasts are the empires that come and go in the world. And that often cause great problems for the people of God. There was the Babylonian Empire, which had taken the people of God into exile. They'd be replaced by the, the Medo-Persians and, and, and the Greeks and the Romans. But John sees these empires coming and going, which is important to remember if you're in the midst of great suffering. It feels as if the opposition is never going to go away, but these are simply human powers that will not last forever. But then John sees one like a son of man, approaching the Ancient of Days, which is God the Father, and being given by the Ancient of Days all authority over heaven and earth forever. Yes. Get that. He's not saying, I'm just a son of man, me. He's saying, I am the one to whom God has entrusted all authority in heaven and earth forever. And when John looks to see the voice that he's hearing, speaking to him, he sees one like a son of man. He sees the one that Daniel saw, the one who reigns as the Lord of all. He's dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, verse 13. It's a priestly robe. He's got a golden sash, which indicates great authority. His hair is white like wool, verse 14, as white as snow. And that's mixing the imagery of Daniel 7. It's the Ancient of Days, God the Father in the vision, who has hair that's white like wool, which speaks of his eternity and his wisdom. And now we're being told that this Son of Man is not just a human king, he's a divine king. And the verse 14, his eyes are like blazing fire. He sees everywhere, which is worth pausing and contemplating for a moment, isn't it? He sees everywhere. How does that make you feel? It's a rather discomforting thought, isn't it? Because by and large, when we know people are looking, we can brush up quite well. And I must admit, most of you look quite good this morning. You've made an effort. You've brushed your hair. You put on decent clothes. And we can make an effort to morally. We don't normally, when we come to church, show the worst of ourselves. But Jesus sees us everywhere. When we're at home, when no one else is watching, he sees how we treat our husband or wife, our kids, our parents, brothers and sisters. He sees how we behave at work. He sees how we behave when no one is looking and we're on our own. He sees everything. That's discomforting, isn't it? But it's also hugely encouraging. These eyes like blazing fire see everything. You come this week, you're exhausted because you've been battling a particular temptation. And no one else knows what a struggle it's been. Jesus sees. Or you've been longing for a colleague to come to Christ or a family member and you've been praying and praying and praying and you've kept praying for a long time. No one else sees. Jesus sees with his eyes like blazing fire. Yeah. Verse 15, think of his feet. They're like bronze glowing in a furnace. No feet of clay there. And the end of verse 15 his voice like the sound of rushing waters. I can imagine John writing this on the island of Patmos as the waves crash into the rocks. And he's thinking, that's, that's like Jesus' voice. It sounds like that. Such power, such life and vitality. And then verse 16. Out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. It speaks of the the power and authority of his word to enforce his will. And the end of verse 16, his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Do you remember on the Mount of Transfiguration? Peter was able to see with James and John, as it were, the veil lifted and the glory of God in Christ seen as he shone. And here John sees again the glory of God in the face of Christ. It's easy, isn't it, to be intimidated by the powers of this world? By the boss at work? Even by our peers 
that we want to impress. Easy to be intimidated. Maybe culturally to be intimidated. It was fascinating in that Supreme Court decision about same-sex marriage that a, a dissenting judgment came from the Chief Justice who said that he was worried about uh, the rights of Christians who took a different view in years to come, or religious rights. And certainly in, in our part of the world, we're finding sometimes that we are out of sync with the culture, and that can get us into legal problems, and that we can be frightened of that kind of stuff. And certainly the powers of this world can be very powerful, but compared to Jesus, yes. nothing. Amen. He's the Lord of all. Wonderful. Wonderful. But more than that, verse 17 and 18, he's the Lord of death. Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. John looks round to hear the voice. And who is this voice that's speaking? He sees this amazing vision and he falls on his feet as though dead. I was playing golf not long ago and I was just practicing on a golf green, my putting, and I put down two balls, which uh, if you're a golfer, as you know, technically speaking, you're not meant to play with two balls. But I wasn't holding anyone behind, I wasn't doing any damage to, to the course, I was just putting with two balls on a golf course, no one behind me. And then I heard a voice. By the way, it is forbidden to play with two balls, rather aggressively, I thought. <laughs> and so I looked up to see who this voice was, where it was, because there seemed to be no one around. I, I was wondering, is this going to be the president of the club or the secretary or the captain, someone important? And I saw some ordinary Joe who I'd never met before, who was just being a busybody, frankly. <laughs> and uh, I, I managed, it was a kind of superhuman effort, it can only be the spirit of God, I managed to be polite. <laughs> With a little edge to it, I must admit, I'm so sorry to have upset you. And uh, then I carried on to the next hole, and he was out of sight, and I did exactly the same again. <laughs> because frankly, when I looked at him, even though I managed to hide it just about, I thought to myself, who are you? That's not a voice I need to listen to. But when John hears the voice, he looks, there's none of that in him. He falls at his feet as though dead. Have you ever been afraid of Jesus Christ? If not, we've not seen him as he is. It's such a low view of Christ that people have in our world today very often. It may be from the old pictures, you know, the gentle Jesus, meek and mild with his sandals and his nighty and his sun-silk permed hair. You know, kind of spiritual version of the Milky Bar Kid, if you have the Milky Bar Kid in Australia. You know, very nice in his own way, but to, nothing to, to worry about. If, if you're not into him, fine. You're not worried about him. That's not the real Jesus. The real Jesus is the Lord of the universe. Yes. And not only powerful, but absolutely blazingly holy and perfect. And if we see him as he is and have a, a sense of ourselves as we are, we'll be terrified. And that's a right response. And it's only once we begin to realize, I do not deserve to be in the same room as this man and this God. I should run from him. I deserve to be zapped by him. That's when we're ready to hear the gospel. Because that's when we hear the words of amazing grace. What does he say? He placed his right hand on me and said, verse 17, do not be afraid. Did you know that that is the most common command in the Bible? Don't be afraid. As again and again, people encounter God and they are petrified because they see how holy he is and how sinful and wretched they are and they run from him and God in his grace says, don't be afraid, come. And he's able to say it because Jesus Christ died on a cross to take the punishment we deserve. So that if we trust in him, we're forgiven. And we can come and approach him with confidence because of his grace. Don't be afraid, he says. And then he says these amazing words. I am the first and the last. Again, he's echoing the Old Testament. The prophet Isaiah 44 and verse 6. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. 
So who says, I am the first and I am the last? God says that, says Isaiah. And here we have Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, saying, I am the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. He has the power of death. He's beaten it. When I was at school, we used to have to go for a flu jab once a year, and I hate injections. And the first time I did it, we were all heading to this, uh, it was like a house, really, which is a sick room, and there was a long line of kids queuing up to go in. And it was a long wait. It was terrifying. And the first kid went in, and I could tell you the relief. About a minute later, he went out the other door and came out the other side, and I thought, oh, there's life beyond this injection. <laughs> he went in, and then he came out, and I saw one after the other following him in and then going out. Jesus went in to death, and he came out the other side. He's beaten it. See, when he broke through the gates of death, which he did when he rose. He called in at the reception on the way, and he got all the keys, and he's got them with him. Which means if we trust in him and we go into death, he'll give us the key to get us out of death and Hades, which is the place of the dead. So if you trust in him, you've got nothing to fear. Which John's first readers really need to hear. Because death was a real possibility for them. Domitian was the emperor at the time, and Domitian was a man who really did not suffer from low self-esteem. If you met the emperor Domitian, he would not have said to you, oh, hi, nice to meet you, just call me Dom. Not at all. Domitian might well have said to you, call me Dominus et Deus Noster, our Lord and God. And if you didn't call him Lord and God, you might be killed. And Christians knew there's only one Lord and God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They can't worship as God a mere human emperor. And so some of them were killed for their refusal to do this. And Jesus is saying, look, I am the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead. I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. So you don't have to fear What's the worst that those voices that we're tempted to listen to could do to us if we don't listen to them? What's the worst? A cold shoulder, perhaps? Being overlooked for promotion or not getting the job? Losing a few friends? That's the worst. The worst that the Romans could do to the Christians was kill them. And even that was not decisive. Because Jesus Christ is the Lord of all and the Lord of death. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German Christian, was killed for standing up for Christ and opposing the Nazis just a short time before the end of the Second World War. And as he was led to his death in the concentration camp, he was heard to say, this is the end. But for me, it is the beginning. The Lord of all the Lord of death, and then finally, the Lord of the church. Verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So the stars, he's saying, are the angels of the churches and there's some debate as to what that means. And... You can take your pick. I'm, I'm, I change my mind. It either means the leaders, the chief pastor of the church, could be, or it means the spiritual counterparts of the church in the heavenly realms, as if there's a kind of an angelic equivalent or a, a patron angel, as it were, for the church. That might be right as well. We don't know. But there's no doubt what these lampstands represent, the seven of them. They are the churches. And seven churches are listed which we know are in what is now Western Turkey. But we also know from research that at the time there were more than seven churches in that region. So the question is why only seven are mentioned? And you may know that in chapter 2 and chapter 3, 
the Lord Jesus addresses a different letter to each of those seven churches. Well, if you know anything about the book of Revelation, you'll know that the number seven is significant. This whole book is arranged in a series of sevens. The number seven stands for God. It's, it's the number of completion and perfection. It's the divine number. So why seven churches? I take it because they represent all churches, all churches then and indeed all churches for all time. And those seven letters are addressed to the totality of churches throughout history. So where is this Lord of all and this Lord of death? He's among the seven lampstands. He's in his church. That's what he's saying, verse 13. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. That would have been huge for those to whom John was addressing this book. Just imagine turning up to church in those days, at a time of great persecution. You're looking around to see who's missing. And when you see them, you're not thinking necessarily, oh, they must be ill. You're wondering, have they been taken? Because others have been, by the secret police, sent to exile, like the senior pastor. He hasn't been around for a number of years now. And various of the elders are disappearing as well. No one quite knows where they are. Have they been taken to prison? Are they dead? That's the atmosphere. And as yet another church member's gone missing, imprisoned or even killed for their faith, you must be thinking to yourself, where is God? Isn't Jesus meant to be king? He doesn't feel like it. Where are you, Lord? And John says, he's among the lampstands. He's right in your midst. If you could only see him. But two or three are gathered. There I am, he says, in the midst. You might be here today without a loved one. Maybe they're sick at home. And you go back and, and they say, who was at church today? And you go, so, well, well, John and Jane were here and, and Pete and, uh, oh, Mrs. Mrs. So-and-so. And, and Jesus was here. He is. Every time we meet, he's with us among the landstands. And every time we scatter by his Holy Spirit, he's with us wherever we go. He's with us as a mighty king, fighting for us with his double-edged sword in his mouth, protecting us in the spiritual battle, overruling over everything bad that happens to us to ensure that it works for his glory. He's already defeated Satan. Yes. It's just a matter of time before he returns and everyone sees it. He's with us as a mighty king. But he's with us too as a tender priest. Do you remember that robe he's wearing? It's a priestly robe. And it was the priest's job in the temple, amongst other things, to tend the lampstands. In the temple in Jerusalem, there were these lampstands. And the priest would trim the wicks, carve the wax, Breathe life into the flickering flames. Maybe you've got responsibility for other believers. As an elder in the church. Or in a small group, in the youth group. And it's such hard work. And sometimes the faith is, is flickering in people's lives and you're desperately trying to keep it going and you feel it's all about you and you just can't cope with it. Jesus is doing it. Oh, he's using you as well. But you're not the only one concerned. He's far more concerned and he's amongst us tending the lampstands as a tender priest, as a mighty king, and as a great prophet. Do you remember the person of this vision? It wasn't simply that John would look in awe at an amazing figure, but rather that he might listen. And then having listened, might communicate to others the message that he proclaimed. And so I end where I began, with lots of voices. We can hear them in our hearts even now. We can certainly hear them as we scatter from this place. 
Lots of people saying, this is the way, this is the way, this is the way. And Jesus Christ amidst them all, saying, no, this is the way. And as we look at that way, we realize it's going to be costly. For some of you this week, very costly. Why should you listen? Why should you obey? Because of the one who speaks. Yes. He's the Lord of all. The Lord of death. The Lord of the church. Maybe there's someone here this morning and you've never responded to the voice of Jesus. And I want to plead with you to do that for the first time. He's saying to you, I know everything about you. I've seen everything. And you deserve nothing from me except condemnation. But I love you. And I died to take the penalty for your sins so you can be forgiven. So you just need to say, thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Please come into my life and help me to keep listening to you and obeying you. I urge you to do that. And if that's you, please talk to maybe a Christian friend or one of the staff members because you'll need help to keep on listening to Jesus and following him. And for the rest of us who are Christian, we need to keep listening and keep obeying. It's worth it. In the midst of the suffering, let's not forget the kingdom. Jesus is Lord. One day everyone will know it, and he's speaking to us as the king. And that should encourage us to keep going the way of patient endurance for his glory.